we were really trying to accommodate the architects and coupled that with with the service, I think that really helped us to differentiate ourselves, kind of breathe some some new life into uh, what the architects were seeing from other consultants. Business of Architecture, episode 301. Welcome back, Architect Nation. Today's guest is Wade Cleary. In today's episode, you'll discover how Cleary and his business partner, Danny Zimmerman, have grown a remarkably successful engineering firm in Texas. Now, I first heard about Wade and what he has been doing from the owner of an architecture firm who's working with me in one of the Business of Architecture premium programs. I heard how Cleary is methodical about spending time doing business development work to solidify and improve the relationships of trust with his network. The firm Cleary Zimmerman has a strong culture of valuing and growing team members, which has been integral to its success, and you'll get to hear all about that. So without further ado, here's my interview with Wade Cleary, principal and founder of Cleary Zimmerman Engineers. Hello, Wade, and welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Good morning. How are you? Doing excellent. Thank you. So tell us, how did Cleary Zimmerman get started? Well, it was, it was kind of interesting. Uh, my business partner and I, Danny Zimmerman, had worked together at an architectural engineering firm. Um, they had they had started in the 50s and then brought engineering in in the in the mid 70s. Uh, I joined at, right out of school in the early 90s, and uh, over time became a partner. So there was uh, one other engineering partner and myself with uh, six or seven other architecture partners. And uh, uh, a few years after I became partner, um, the other engineering partner passed away, and um, I was. Uh, it was, so it was me and, and six or seven architectural partners, and um, we we and we worked very well together. And I uh, have very fond memories of, of, of working with those guys. Certainly learned a lot. Um, but what I I kind of came to the conclusion with over time was that their their passion was architecture, and uh, we kind of felt on the engineering side of the house we felt more like a, a support service as opposed to um, really one of the mainline offerings or, or the purpose of the firm. And, and uh, uh, it, it was kind of an, an awkward dance, if you will, with uh, with Danny and I, him essentially working underneath me and um, somehow us revealing to each other that we both wanted to, to do something different. Uh, but we, we finally had that awkward conversation and um, decided to branch out on our own. Um, we were very fortunate when we did this in that um, the the architectural partners, when I presented my my desires to them, they could have gone two routes. They could have said, uh, "Well, we have a, a non-compete clause in your in your uh, buy sell agreement and in the partnership agreement, and uh, we'll find somebody else to lead this department, and uh, uh, you know then then we'll have a non-compete for clients and those sorts of things going forward." But uh, I was fortunate in that they decided that they came to the conclusion that architecture was really their passion, and and they uh, were going to go ahead and just wind down the engineering group, and uh, and so that's what, that's how we started out. We started out, Danny and I did with with six folks, and very fortunate to have work from day one. We were able to continue on the contracts that were ongoing, um, and so that really helped us start with momentum. Uh, having having that work going and you know and being able to realize some uh, cash flow within it, it still took us four or five months to get cash flow coming in the door but uh, uh, certainly things could have been very different and uh, feel very fortunate in that regard. It sounds like the architecture partners may have been having the same conversation in their own heads going on. You know, I, I, they had and it was interesting. We at one of our retreats maybe. I think a year before I decided to do that, um, one of the partners uh, vocalized that maybe we ought to wind down engineering, and, and he didn't get a lot of traction with that. But uh, I, you know, I, I sensed that, that you know, that, that really again that was their passion, and and uh, I think once they um, they were kind of pushed in that direction, they and forced to to consider uh, give it more thought, they they came to that conclusion. And, yeah, it's been interesting. Uh, certainly, they have thrived uh, since we left. Uh, they have continued to grow and have done very well. Uh, and certainly, we still do a lot of work with them, which uh, 
which has been been we're very fortunate in that regard. Now, what are some of the challenges of just going back to that time period of balancing? If you have an AE team together, where it's whether it's a big A, little E, or big E, little A, what were some of the challenges that you found just getting the work done with that team? I know that sometimes it can be hard to maintain a balance. Maybe the architects don't have enough work to feed the engineers. Do you bring in outside work? What were some of the challenges of being in a firm that offered both engineering and architectural services? One of the challenges was um, we we had on the engineering side we had a tough time um, finding work with outside architectural firms. Um, there were instances where uh, maybe we had on the engineering side a long term relationship with a client, and um, they would I, I would call it a shotgun marriage. They would um, they would have us work with other architects from from other firms and. In general, those projects would go very well, and, and in some cases, we would develop a, a real a wonderful rapport with, with some of these uh, firms. And I would go to meet with them afterwards and, and uh, talk to them about the idea of us doing more work with them for other clients. And uh, usually the conversation went went like this. It was, uh, Wade, we, we enjoy working with, with you and your, with, and your team, um, but we feel like you're our competition, and if we were to engage you guys with some of our other clients um there's a fear on our part that you, know, you may end up bringing in your architects at some point so um and, and i can i can appreciate their perspective and so it it, it kind of handicapped us to grow uh on the engineering side um and so uh, uh anyway and then and then again i i, I still felt like um some of the challenges working with in-house folks is that um, without that formality of having an outside, without us being a formal different entity, um, there were there were a lot of instances where um, uh, you know, we were asked to jump through hoops. Maybe that if if we were an outside consultant, they wouldn't ask. You know, I think they felt more comfortable coming and saying, "Well, we're all." We're all in this together, and, and uh, um, they could they could push a little harder for asking for us to uh, to pull a rabbit out of the hat. And, uh, uh, certainly, that that goes on still today, uh, but it seems like to a lesser degree. So it's been a different dynamic with us being out of house. Wade, what's your perspective on just from what you saw working closely with architects and as a partner with architects? Did you see mm-hmm. any? generalities in terms of how architects tend to approach business versus how you approached business as an engineer. Can you draw any, any, I guess, some generalities about, about that? I, I, I would, I, I, I tend to find that architects or many architects are more, uh, are less focused on the business side and profitability and looking at um, the individual profitability of individual projects, you know, what their budgeted hours are, those sorts of things. I found that, that many of the, of the folks, certainly in the firm that we were in, um, they were very passionate about design and, and the art side of architecture and um, less concerned about profitability and the business side of things. Um, and it's, it's interesting as we have worked with other firms now, um, that's probably more more the norm um, and I, I certainly we run across firms that are very focused on the business side of things but in general we find that more more architectural firms are uh, less focused on the business side and profitability so I was seeing on your website Wade that you started out with six employees additionally is that right six staff members yes sir and were those people that you hired, or were those people that came over from the engineering vi- division of the previous firm? Um, all, all except for one came with us from the uh, from the previous firm. Um, the only person that we hired new was a uh, an admin person that answered phones, did bookkeeping, and uh, wore a lot of hats in those early days. And you mentioned that it took you a while to get cash flow going, about six months. How did you close that gap from a finance perspective? Well, as we started out, we ended up um, 
securing an SBA loan, um, which my business partner and I um, put up our, our houses for collateral. And um, we also had an angel investor that um, I knew um, for many, many years. And we were fortunate enough that um, with his initial seed money, um, I think we, we he gave us some initial money um, and then gave us another injection of dollars. Um, but we never had to uh, pull down on that SBA line of credit, which we felt very fortunate to, to be in that position. Uh, certainly Danny and I did not take salaries for um, three or four months, if I remember right. Um, so we had to save up in advance in anticipation of that. Um, but we've been, we've been fortunate going forward. We were able to pay back the angel investor within, with eight, within 18 months of, of opening. And, um, we have never had, we don't have a line of credit and we've been fortunate to never have to use one uh, since we've been in operation. That's impressive. Now, collateralizing your house, that, that was probably an interesting conversation. <laughs> yes, it was. It certainly, uh, it, made my, my wife nervous and, and Danny's wife nervous. Uh, I had uh, two young children at home and uh, you know, uh, my wife did, wasn't working at the time. And uh, so there, this was uh, a little nerve wracking and certainly put a lot of fire underneath us to, to succeed. Mm. And when you first started out, when you looked at that first year, what was the vision? Did you have a clear growth plan at that time? We did, and it, it's interesting. Uh, we put together a very detailed business plan, um, you know, a hundred plus pages, and in one of the sections in there was our growth projections and staffing projections. And uh, we find it almost comical. Occasionally, we'll pull it off the shelf and flip through it, but we projected that. Um, I, I believe we started in June. We we projected that by the end of that first year, we would add one person. Uh, the next 12 months, we projected hiring two more. Um, I believe that within, if I remember right, within five years, we thought we might have a dozen folks overall. Um, and um, within the first 12 months of opening, we had 15 people and um, we're, we're still on a hiring spree and had outgrown our office space. It was just, uh, just exceeded our expectations. <laughs> Definitely blew the uh, the business plan projections out of the water. <laughs> Certainly did. And what would you say, looking back, what was the driver of that growth? Now, what we didn't mention or discuss yet was that you guys opened shop about a year before the crash or maybe 18 months before that huge recession. Right, right. Um, I, I think a lot of it had to do with just our focus on service. Um, and that, that meant simple things like returning phone calls within a few hours, um, endeavoring to, to just be uh, tremen, tremen, to, to have a tremendous amount of communication and high levels of service. Um, and then also, I, I think having worked alongside uh, architects in the, in the firm for those many years, I think it gave us also an appreciation for what they were trying to achieve from a, from a design perspective and we wanted to um, uh, help architects in that way, we, um, as opposed to just taking a kind of a stodgy old engineer approach of, um, I know what's best and I'm going to give you what I think is best. And um, I'm not going to put a lot of consideration into how what the things that you're trying to accomplish from a design perspective. Um, we, I think we appreciated that and we were really trying to accommodate the architects and you know, couple that with with a service, I think that really helped us to differentiate ourselves, kind of breathe some, some new life into uh, what the architects were seeing from other consultants. I think we were also fortunate in that time frame that uh, we were able to secure some, some federal and governmental type contracts. And those were the things that really helped us to even grow during that recession. Um, we had some, some federal work and um, some state and local municipal type work, some K through 12 work, um, and we were we were just very blessed to have that um, able to grow during that recession when 
when many other folks were really struggling. As an architect myself, I can see how the willingness to adapt and to entertain other solutions would definitely be a catalyst for making the architects <laughs> happy. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think just trying to, um, you know, again, understand where they're coming from and be helpful. Uh, not everybody gets that. When you looked at uh, hiring and bringing new people on board, what's your approach to that? Because it's, we all know it's difficult to f not only find the right people, but to hire them, to get them excited, to integrate them into the culture, to keep them around, to not have turnover, to onboard them, and the list goes on and on. You guys have really scaled pretty, pretty substantially. You start at six, and what's the size of the firm now? We've got 63 folks today. Um, but, but you're right, and, and we, admittedly, we struggled with um, our hiring early on. We were able – we, uh, we didn't put the effort into it that we should have um, into the hiring process, and, and we were quick to hire. And you know, through that process, we brought on some great folks, but we also really missed the mark on a few. And um, it was, I guess, five, six years into it that we said, time out. We have – we had we had a person that we hired, and within two days, we we had to let him go. This guy, we really missed the mark. We thought, uh, not only is this unfair to that person that left gainful employment somewhere else to come join us, but um, it was stressful, stressful for the leadership, stressful for the other team members that were um, watching all of this. And, and so we said we got to do better, and and we came up with this hiring process where we've got. Um, I forgot to count the number of steps, but it's got five or six steps to it. Um, and we are adamant about going through all of them. Um, but our, the first one is I, I do all of these. It's, a, it's a just an initial 35, 30, 45 minute conversation. And I'm just trying to get to know that person. Certainly, I, I want to hear a little bit about their technical skills. But other than that, I'm trying to figure out who they are as a person. Um, if they if they pass my test on that, then I get them to do a, an online personality test, which, um, again, real simple. Then they come in and do. If I may ask, what interview. personality tests uh, do you use, Wade? Um, we do the DISC test, and I forget the name of the other one. It's got ten different uh, attributes that it's testing for. Um, shoot, I forget the name of that second one, but. Um, no problem. Uh, it's it's not the Myers Briggs, right? No. Um, okay. Uh, dog on it, um, but uh, but we find that very helpful too. And and um, how do you use that information? Well, you know, we're, certainly if we're looking for somebody to do business development, or, or uh, yeah, there's certain things that we would want somebody. If, and if they're in that role, we want them to be uh, highly communicative ex and an extrovert. Um, we want them to be driven and, and and these test scores are pretty good indicators of somebody's tendencies in those areas um, yeah and but what we also find is that we, you know, with that with, with with a few exceptions we can work with almost any personality type but it's knowing how to work with them and how to communicate with them and so for instance from some of these tests we can see that um, you know maybe when you kick off a project with somebody some folks, want to know how the relationship started with this client, how, how the pursuit, how we pulled the project in the door, what are all the things that are going to make this project a success? And it's a, it's a 10 minute um, debrief with somebody. Um, but then if I use that same approach to other personalities, they're sitting there tapping their finger on the desk and, and saying, why are you wasting my time? Um, and they're driving a bananas. Um, and so, you know, understanding how different folks communicate and like to work has helped us. And so, um, you know, like on a pretty routine basis, we'll pull those tests back out and, and think, okay, that's why that conversation didn't go so well with so-and-so. And, -so. and um, that, you know, that's a good reminder for me. Now, next time I need to, I need to communicate with them this way. So, um, and we share those tests with all of our, our leadership team. We've even, I haven't gotten around to doing it, but we've talked about um, posting 
the test re- because you can do a bar chart with those or, or different ways to graphically represent those test results. We've talked about printing those out in color uh, in a nice format and putting it outside their cubicle wall. So as you walk up to somebody's space, you can, okay, da, 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 I see how they how they communicate and, and what their tendencies are. And, and uh, you know, as you as you uh, work with those results enough, you you can quickly understand what makes different folks tick. Um, I'm, I'm working on getting that implemented. <laughs> yeah, for our listeners, I, I use DISC a lot, and there's a book that one of my mentors turned on to me. It's, uh, it's called It's a Zoo Around Here, and it's by Ooh, Nigel okay. Reisner. And okay. it basically characterizes the different DISC profiles as an animal, and it tells you how to talk to them. Uh, because you're right, people understand things differently. And for instance, someone who's a high D uh, is not going to want the whole story behind something. They're just going to want mm-hmm. the facts and let's get some results and make it happen. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Awesome. Now, th- we've kind of talked, ab- we've kind of veered into leadership a little bit, which is great. You talked about how you, you'll have conversations with staff and think, oh, well, that didn't go exactly like we had hoped. And you look back at their personality information like, well, now we can see how we could have done this better. What other tips have you found to be important as a leader of people? Certainly, um, trying to be very open and communicative with folks, um, helping. And I, I, I've realized, too, that saying things once to somebody or, or to a group isn't enough. We need to continually reinforce and repeat the things that are important to, to us, um, to our, to our team, you know, and, and to them individually. Um, certainly we need to uh, be very encouraging. And, um, I, I think, you know, my natural tendency is probably just to, uh, have high expectations of folks and not, and just my expectation is that you're going to do all these things right and, and be successful. And when you do them, uh, not even acknowledge it. Um, and so I, I've had to work on that and, uh, make sure I go over and acknowledge when folks are, are doing things well and give them a pat on the back. Um, you know, talk about successes in our staff meeting and just be very open and communicative. Um, and, and then certainly when things, uh, when somebody needs some encouragement or, or something isn't going quite right to, uh, you know, quietly pull them aside and, and talk through it. Um, uh, in a you know in a very calm and encouraging manner, um, but I, I think that that has served us well. Got it. And when you look at, uh, I've noticed that you have over the years you've added additional service offerings to the firm in terms of what you're offering. What why have you done that? Well, we we, we have a real desire to grow, uh, and we've um, looked at adding these different offerings, things that complement our core service of engineering. Um, so over the years, things that we've added have included commissioning, uh, IT security, uh, water, wastewater. Um, and then we've added a, an industrial market to our, to our offerings as well. Um, at one point in time, we added a, a building analytics uh, offering that we ultimately had to, had to, uh, to wind down. Um, but uh, we feel like these things have have not only helped us to grow, but they've also helped to differentiate us from other firms that maybe can't provide this uh, holistic, comprehensive uh, list of services. And so, uh, if we can be that one-stop shop for folks, it uh, I think it makes us more attractive. You mentioned that you have a desire to grow. Why do you desire to grow? I, you know, I guess it's there's there's many facets to that. Certainly. Um, that's it, just part of my DNA and Danny's DNA. That that's exciting for us. Um, and, and then we've also come to the conclusion that if we're not growing, we're dying. Um, if you know, and if we're not growing, we're not creating new opportunities for our, our rising stars. Um, and if we don't create opportunities for them, and and they truly are rising stars and very ambitious, they're going to go find those opportunities somewhere else. And so. Um, we, we need to continue to create opportunities for, for growth and leadership for, for these young folks. Um, anyway, it, it, it's just, I think that's just, again, part of our DNA. It, it excites us. Uh, 
to to go out and uh, meet new people and 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 grow our business. Wade, what have been the primary lessons that you've learned going from someone who was primarily a technician or an engineer to becoming a business leader and someone who is running a business and and managing operations and marketing and business development? I, yeah, certainly. Um, my natural tendency, and like most engineers, is is, is introverted and, and quiet, and, and focusing on the on the technical side of things. And um, um, I've had to um, push myself to do things that maybe I wasn't necessarily comfortable with um, early on, um, and still probably struggle with a little bit today. Um, you know, again, my comfort zone or, or my happy place isn't necessarily out at a uh, business development function or a, a political fundraiser or something like that. But that's, those are, those are the sorts of things that I need to do in order to grow and promote my business. And then certainly, you know, just the, the people side of things. I, I, I'm a, a lifelong learner and constantly reading and I'm uh, routinely reading books on how to uh, encourage and motivate our, our folks and, and how to understand and, and interact with folks. And, uh, I think you've got to be that lifelong learner and Want to want to grow yourself as well. Now, Wade, to fuel the growth that you've had, you you mentioned earlier that a large part of that has been the service, and then also the flexibility of working with your clients, understanding where they're coming from, what they need. Has everything been word of mouth, or have you used other strategies to grow the firm? No, we we tried to have a a, a very solid for, uh, social media presence. Certainly, um, our website we've evolved that and had numerous changes and updates to that over the years uh, we've uh, we've had bursts of success on our other social media platforms Facebook Twitter um, Instagram um, and and obviously you have to have somebody that's engaged and plugged in and focused on those the different platforms um, today you know we had a, a person engaged with that, and she uh, she got married and, and moved on to another city, um, and so we've been struggling a little bit on some of those platforms over the last few months. But um, you know, when we had somebody focused on those areas, uh, we we were really I think it was bringing some some attention to us, um, and then certainly um, you know being being active out in the community, having uh, we've um, we've kind of bounced around with the model of seller doer, and certainly we uh, have a seller doer model today. But we've also added some dedicated business development folks. So being being present and active in the community um, is, is very important to to our business, to our, to our growth. Now, Charlie Burris, shout out to Charlie for introducing us, who is a principal at the Architect Studio based out of Bryan, Texas. He mentioned he mm -hmm. told me and um, you can confirm or deny this, that you have a specific amount of time every week that you spend and you focus on business development. Can you tell me about that? Sure, sure. Um, we've, you know, as a, as a base level, uh, we've gone through and looked at all of our clients and, and we've kind of put uh, groupings to them. Um, and we won't share who, who's in which group, but we have kind of an A, B, and C grouping. And, and we've gone through and said, okay, the A client, I need to, to touch them, we call it touches, um, at least four times a year. Uh, a, a B category is at least twice a year, and a C is, is once a year. Um, and then what, it, what we classify as a touch, it's, it's not um, talking to them about, you know, if you're on a project together and you see them at a project meeting, that, that's not a touch. A touch is a, a focused interaction. You know, it's a lunch. It's Going golfing, uh, going to dinner with them and their spouse. You know, it's it's a dedicated, focused interaction with them, um, and we have divided those up. Um, and it, it was kind of an interest, an engineer's approach to this. And so we said, if we've got a hundred A's and fifty B's and and twenty C's, I'm just making this up. But then you you multiply all that out and say, okay, I, there there's I'm just come up with a random number, but that's 500 touches that we've got to do over the course of the year. Um, if we divide these clients up this way, that means um, I think my, my touch ratio is about 
3.2 touches per week. Um, and so I thought, well, I, yeah, I, I, I can do that. I need to, I'll have to uh, be very thoughtful about how I do it, but I can, I can do that. Um, and then some, some weeks, some months, I'm a little short and other weeks I'm, I, uh, I do a little more, but those are the, the base activities that I'm doing in addition to um, interactions of opportunity or, or maybe um, uh, networking events and those sorts of things. And so I'm um, really, I think if I have a, a, a to-do list or a, a, a matrix that I'm trying to check the boxes on, I do a lot better with that than just randomly waking up each morning or each week and saying, what can I go chase? Um, if I've got a, a system or a plan to it, that, that helps me. And it's certainly how my, how my brain works. Now, speaking of how brain works as, as introverts, which I consider myself one as well, look, it's, it's hard naturally to want to be out there to connect with people, to go to networking events. And I, I kind of heard a little bit of that from you as well. What strategies, mm-hmm. techniques, or things have you learned way to help get you over that? Or you just power through it and you just say, I just need to do this. <laughs> it's probably a little bit of both. Certainly, um, I've being a lifelong learner, I, I wish I could remember the name of some of these books that I've read um, about it, but um, I've learned that one of, one of the books I read, and it, it, it uh, really summarized me well, it, it talked about this idea of, of you've got this internal battery and uh, what's draining from my battery is going to a, a large networking event where there's a hundred people and I need to uh, walk around and strike up conversations with a variety of people that drains me. And I'm, I'm tired by the time I leave that. Um, and my battery gets charged by um, maybe being, being by myself or with just one or two people. Um, and it's funny, my, my wife is the opposite. It, her battery gets charged by doing those sorts of things. But um, so in order I, I make sure I get rest before I do those sorts of things. And I also try not to do um, a breakfast, a lunch, and a nighttime networking event all on the same day. I just, I, my battery, I don't have any battery left by the end of, by that last event if I try and do all of that. Um, I've also learned little techniques. If I, maybe I go to a big networking event um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm getting worn down. Um, I may go out into the lobby or, or out somewhere and check emails for five or 10 minutes and just give myself a little bit of break, an opportunity to recharge. Um, and then certainly these things get easier over time. If you can find um, what we've also, uh, we, we preach to our folks is that if there's several of us that know each other at, at an event, you don't huddle up in the same crowd. You're not allowed to talk to each other. You have to go find your own people to talk to kind of forced interaction there, but um, but also if, if you can uh, you know, seek out people that you know first, um, it, it makes it much easier. And then usually um, as you're sitting there talking to them, folks that they know will come up and introduce themselves. And it's, it, it's an easier starting point. Um, and then I also too, I, I give myself some grace, you know, maybe a networking event might be from uh, five to nine and I give myself some grace and, um, Maybe I go from five to seven, and, you know, unless I'm just uh, uh, really engaged with a bunch of people and, and I'm feeling great, then I'll, I'll stay as long as I can. But otherwise, I give myself some grace to uh, – I feel like I've, I've done done what I needed to do, and, I, and then I can just move on. Got it. And I just out of curiosity, how much new development, business development do you do, and how do you approach that as opposed to touching existing contacts? It's a, it's a fair amount. Um, and – I, I, I don't know if it's 50-50, but I, I say we probably spend a little more time on um, maintaining clients. And then, you know, so maybe it's a 60-40 split with the, with the new development. Um, and that's where we're – certainly we have business leads groups that we're active in or um, that's where we get a lot of our opportunities uh, or just uh, being open-minded and, and having your eyes wide open all the time and, and looking for things pulling on every thread you can, turning over every rock you can. Yeah, what are some of the business, what kind of business leads groups are you involved in? Well, you, it, it's been interesting. We have a number of these where uh, we have a group of folks that uh, 
that maybe one's a geotech, one's an architect, another one is a contractor. You know, then we've even got um, a furniture supplier in there or a lighting rep. And, and uh, usually we try and keep a group where we've only got usually only one of each from each business category. And then we'll uh, meet at someone's office every couple of weeks, or maybe we'll, we'll meet for, for cocktails in the afternoon or something like that. Um, we've got four or five of those that, uh, that we're involved with. Um, I've also got uh, this group that, that formed many, many years ago, similar, similar to that, it, uh, or it's almost kind of like Rotary. And it's a much larger group that isn't just focused on our industry. Um, and uh, anyway, we, we meet at, uh, I'm not a member at the country club, but one of the country clubs, but the, these guys, most of these guys are, and I've got plugged in with them. And uh, anyway, those, those, these sorts of groups have, all, have always helped us a lot. Uh, you know, and, and again, you don't always get a great tip at every uh, meeting, but uh, you routinely find things. And then we've also learned too that we need to be bring opportunities to other folks too. You can't just be uh, constantly on the taking end of, or on the receiving end of all of this. So we need to be looking for opportunities for our for our colleagues and friends there. Wade, my last question for you today is: what is the what is the hidden story that I may have missed in the, today's conversation? What is the the thread, the story, the challenge? Uh, the conversation, something that didn't turn up in our conversation today that you think is pivotal or important or has been impactful in the growth of Clary Zimmerman? I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's a focus on our people. Um, we, we have routinely won best places to work in San Antonio. Uh, I think we've won that six, seven years now. Um, and I, I think our folks, certainly every day is a cakewalk at our office, but in general, I think our folks enjoy coming to work and enjoy the folks that they're working with. And, you know, when you've got folks that, uh, that enjoy what they're doing, uh, they usually are, uh, they, they interact with our clients that much better. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it's helped with our turnover, which again, um, when our clients are seeing the same people day in and day out, as opposed to, uh, a new person on their project, um, a couple of times over the course of a project, you know, all those things um, kind of compound on top of each other. And again, just this this focus on our people uh, and our culture, has, I think, has really helped us over the years. It, it took us a little while to figure that out, but uh, now that we we put a lot of effort and attention into that, you know, and in fact, we're headed out to our summer picnic here later later this afternoon. We're, we're all going to uh, meet at a park and float the river and. Anyway, we do a number of events like that over the course of the year, again, just focusing on our people and making sure everybody's happy. And Wade, what have you figured out? What would you say is the key to being voted best place to work and having a great people culture? Yeah, it, it's, it's it's being flexible, you know, and, and it, Danny and I call it taking the high road. There's, there's lots of instances where maybe we felt like uh, you know, our, our, our policy, our intention was was X, and, and somebody else interpreted it a different way. Uh, we've realized um, it's best to, you know, if it's not, unless it's ridiculous, you you bend and you flex and you let the other guy have his way. And, and uh, otherwise, I think we feel like you know maybe you've won these little battles, but ultimately you're going to lose the war. And so. Uh, and trying to just uh, give where you can and be flexible and put yourself in somebody else's shoes has really helped us. Great. So that's that's a leadership mentality and a way of being. Uh, are there any other things in terms of the way you compensate or the way you do performance evaluations or just the way you instill the culture that you think are key to the, the culture that you do have there? Sure. Well, we, we do. We are adamant about doing annual reviews. Uh, we do that. Uh, November time frame, and, and um, Danny and I sit in 30 or 40 of those each. Uh, we, we'd like to be in everybody's, but uh, but we can. So certainly we have one of us in most of theirs, or and if not, it'll be other very key leaders. Um, and we try to be very competitive with um, our incentive comp program. We've gone to great lengths to share with our staff over the course of the year where how we're doing financially. 
at each monthly staff meeting, we um, show a chart of uh, what our revenues were the previous month, what our new contracts were, what our backlog is, um, and we talk about it a lot so that hopefully folks understand the dynamics of all that, how it works, help them feel comfortable about the security of their positions. Um, and then I feel like we do a pretty good job of uh, rewarding folks at the end of the year with incentive cop, uh, sharing the sharing the rewards with everybody so that uh, hopefully that motivates everyone to uh, you know, be profitable, but, but focus on service. I, th I think reiterating that and talking about it a lot out in the open uh, has, has really helped folks. Have you found that people are more motivated by non-monetary things in the pr in the practice? And uh, if so, what things do you offer to help help them have that? You know, it, it is. I, I certainly, certainly uh, the monetary side of things is important to our folks, but uh, we routinely hear from, from our staff that um, even if they were offered a little more someplace else, they would they would prefer to work at our office. Uh, you know, and, and again, it's all those little things like being flexible about. Um, we're a little bit flexible about start time that that wears on me a little bit, <laughs> but but uh, it's something I've learned to to let go of over the years. And uh, you know, our folks need to leave to uh, take care of a sick child or go get a haircut. If everyone conducts himself in a professional way, we kind of we're, we're a little bit loose in that regard. Um, you know, and again, just uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of other things, but um, again, I have an open door policy, being very, very open about everything that's going on in the office, uh, being very uh, lots of compliments and pats on the backs. You know, reading when we get. Um, Compliments from from our clients. We we read those out loud in the staff meeting. Yeah, it, 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 it's, just, it's just a constant focus on it. Excellent. Well, I snuck in a few last questions there because I realized I needed to follow up when you gave that little nugget of sure. gold. Uh, Wade, thank you for joining us today on the business of architecture. You and your partner Wade have created some amazing things, and it was really fun getting to peer into what that was like. And I'm sure we could dig in a lot more, but we touched on a lot of very important topics. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. I enjoyed our conversation. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash Freedom Webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.